We're going to do permutations of finite sets today. These are just bijections from a set to itself. And uh, the nice thing about this is that even though you may not have seen it before, there are some very routine calculations you can do, and get, you can get faster at them than I am. So uh, I'm sure this will be an easy thing to learn. Um, I have noticed one thing, though. I do a couple of lectures on, on permutations of finite sets in this module, and they come back again in the spring semester in mathematical structures. And uh, it looks like people sometimes have forgotten what I said in this module when, it come, when they come back again in spring. So uh, it's worth, uh, worth not forgetting. Anyway. Now, in general, a permutation of a set is a bijection from the set to itself. So that's injective and surjective. It just moves the elements of the set around. It moves each, all of the different elements to different places, and it arrives at every element of the set from somewhere. Um, and for finite sets, that's pretty much saying the same thing. For infinite sets, permutations are a bit peculiar. Um, we won't normally uh, look too much at permutations of infinite sets, but I'll mention them occasionally in the next lecture. Uh, but here's a five set. This is a set with just five elements in it. And uh, rather than get, get you to vote on this, I'll, uh, I'll just explain how this one works. Uh, so you've got a set with five elements, and the question is how many different permutations are there? So that means... Is it, You know, you, you write the elements down over here. And then you write them again over here. And you have to decide where to send each one. But you have to send each one somewhere different. Um, and that necessarily, because there's five on each side, means that you'll end up hitting everything as well. So you might decide to send 1 to 8, and then you could send 3 to 1, and then you could send 5 to 12, and you could send 8 to 3, and then you've got no choice, you have to send 12 to 5. And I could, I suppose, put these little head lines on the earth to show that that's where I'm mapping them to. Um, this is just one of the possible bijections. Okay, so they all have to go somewhere different, and you have to get to everything but if you can manage one of those, because there's five elements on each side, if you manage to get to everything, then you have to send them somewhere different. And if you manage to, if you manage to send them all somewhere different, then you have to get to everything, because it's a sort of pigeonhole principle at work here. Um, if you start putting letters in different pigeonholes, then by the time you've handed out as many letters as there are pigeonholes, um, if you're avoiding putting more than one in any pigeonhole, then you finished as soon as you've put the right number letters in the pigeonholes. And then if you try to put one more letter in a pigeonhole, then you have to uh, put at least two in, a, in one of the pigeonholes. Right, okay, so when you decide where one... Uh, let's start from the top and say we'll decide where to put one first. And w there's five choices for where one goes. Once you've decided where one goes, there's only four choices left for where you can send number three. And once you've decided where one and three go, there's only three choices left for where number five could go. And then there's two choices left for the next one and one choice for the last one. But they all give you different functions. So, so if you're working out that way, you get five choices for where one goes. Then four choices left for where three goes. and so on, and you get 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120 uh, possible permutations. And, of course, that's 5 factorial. Uh, right, and that works for other finite sets as well, in more generality. So, 
since we're concentrating on finite sets, uh, we've got a natural number n, and x is an n set with elements x1 to xn. Don't really care which order they're in, but they are all different. If x1 up to xn are distinct, that's automatic under what I've said. No repeats, okay? They're distinct means that no two of them are the same. And nor are any three of them. Um, so, in this case, you've got n choices for where to send x1, but then there's only n minus 1 choices left for where to send x2, and by the time you've decided where to send x1 and, and up to xn minus 1, there's only one place left to send xn, and so there's n factorial possible permutations. Yes, n times n minus 1 times, times 2 times 1. Okay, and that number gets quite big, quite fast. If you've got a pack of, say, 52 playing cards, suppose you shuffle a pack of 52 cards. I'm assuming they're 52 different cards in the usual way. Um, then there are 52 factorial possible results. So that gives you 52 factorial ways to shuffle, 52 factorial permutations um, that you can get. Um, which correspond to which order the cards end up in from where you started. Um, it's, uh, that's a big number. You can ask your calculator. Your calculator should be able to cope with 52 factorial. I think it's somewhere around... Uh, in the, uh, the ones which stop at 10 to the 100 run into trouble somewhere in the 70 factorials, I think. So, uh, so you should be all right with 52 factorial. OK, now... Last lecture, we looked at composing functions. And uh, what I want to look at at the moment is composing by ejections, because we're going to multiply permutations together by composing them. And that, that's, good, that's how you multiply permutations. You compose them, um, which makes it a non-commutative kind of multiplication, um, rather like matrix multiplication. In fact, as I said before, very similar to it because matrix multiplication really comes from composition of linear maps, which you'll see later. Um, so, so one of the things we want to know is what happens if you compose bijections and things like that. So let's have, remind you, first of all, of the fact at the end of last lecture, suppose you've got sets X and Y, and of course, with permutations, they'll be the same set, but uh, in general, you can do this anyway. And you've got a function from x to y, but it's a bijection if and only if it's got an inverse function, which comes back. Um, and the composite function has to give you the identity on both sides, and I can remind you what that means. Um, and then the inverse function is unique, and you call it f to the minus 1. Um, and we'll be doing inverses for permutations, uh, which are quite easy, actually. Right, so uh, what have we got? We've got a map from x to y and a map from y back to x. Yeah, and we've got f going from x to y. We've got uh, h coming back again. There's a map from y to itself called the identity map on y. And there's a map from x to itself called the identity map on x. These identity maps don't do anything. They just... Uh, uh, the identity map on y sends each element y to itself. So id y of y equals y for y and y, and id x of x is equal to x for x in x. And um, so to say that when you compose them you get the identity map, that's just telling you that by the time you do the two functions in either order, you always end up back where you started, um, which means that 
If you do h of f of x, you end up back at x. <coughs> That's when h is the inverse. This is, when, this is when h equals the inverse of f. And f of h of y equals y for all y in y. This is when h equals f to the minus 1. That's assuming it's a bijection and that h is the inverse function, then this is what happens. Um, and h is an inverse function if you manage to do this, and then that forces f to be a bijection. And um, the typical examples are things um, we mentioned last time. Um, all the things from calculus as well. So you know about functions and inverse functions by now. Um, this is the abstract, but you've got all these concrete examples around. Um, I'll just remind you of one typical example. For example, f from r goes to the open interval naught infinity defined by f of x equals e to the x. Then the inverse function, f to the minus 1 of y is the natural logarithm. And the uh, that's a bijection in the other direction. Goes from the open interval naught infinity back to R. Okay. So, finally, here's a question to think about then. I've reminded you about that. Um, I've done this one in a slightly different way for once. So, we've got three sets. We've got a pair of functions, f for x to y, and g for y to z. And I'm going to assume they're both bijections. They're bijections, so they do have inverse functions going from somewhere to somewhere. Um, so f to the minus 1 and g to the minus 1 will make sense as long as you figure out where they're going from and to. And now I'm asking you, and I will, I'm telling you that two of the following statements are true, and you have to figure out which two they are. Um, and... So I've offered you well, statements 1 and 3, statements 2 and 4, statements 1 and 4, or statements 2 and 3 as the possible pairs, or you can ask me to explain again. Anyway, see which ones you think are always true whenever, f is a, whenever you have a bijection f from x to y and another bijection g from y to z. I'll pause the recording there and see how you get on with that one. You can vote any time. Okay, let's see uh, what people went for. 58 answers, and big majority for D, but with uh, a substantial minority for C. Let's have a look. Okay, well, D is the correct answer. The majority is doing well. And uh, let's, have a, uh, let's have a look and see what's going on here, and then I'll say a bit more about it. The thing is, you can actually eliminate some of these as not making any sense at all. So, first of all, we've got maps from x going to y going to z. We've got f going from x to y and g going from y to z. So you do have G composed with F going from X to Z, making sense. At least it's a function. Uh, F composed with G doesn't make sense because, uh, well, you're supposed to do... Uh, G composed with F means do F first and then do G. That makes sense because if you do F, you end up in Y and then you can do G afterwards to go to Z. Um, and that's what we mean by G composed with F. F composed with G doesn't make sense because if you do G first, you end up in Z and then you can't apply F because F's, well, at least you don't expect to, because F's defined on X. So, so that doesn't make sense that way around. So we can eliminate F composed with G is not making sense. Um, and then... Uh, now let's see where the inverse functions go. 
There's an inverse function coming back, f to the minus 1, because f is a bijection, so it's got an inverse map. Let's uh, write that again. So there's an f to minus 1 coming back there. There's a g to minus 1 coming back there. Now you can see that you can't do f to the minus 1 first and then do g to minus 1 afterwards, because g to the minus 1 isn't defined on x. But you can do g to the minus 1 first to take you from z into y, and then you can do f to minus 1 to take you from y to x. So um, you have to do g to minus 1 first, so 3 makes sense at least, and 4 doesn't make sense at all. Okay? So we eliminated 1 and 4 that way as not making any sense. Um, now, whether 2 and 3 are actually true or not, needs a bit more thinking about. Now, but there is hope at least. Um, you can define these functions. This is f to the minus 1 composed with g to the minus 1. Take you back. Now, one of the best ways to find out whether something is a bijection is to find an inverse function for it, it turns out. I mean, that's sometimes easier than, it's sometimes easier than actually seeing is it injective, is it surjective, so you can do those and it can be a fairly routine thing. Um, if you actually manage to find an inverse function for it and prove that it works on both sides, then that proves it's a bijection as well. <coughs> And the nice thing about this is these two are inverses to each other. So what you can do is show that this function g composed of f from x to z, which is a function, and this one, f to the minus 1 composed with g to minus 1, which goes from z back to x, you can prove they're mutually inverse, which forces both of them to be bijections. So consider g composed with f, which goes from x goes to z, and f to the minus 1 composed with g to the minus 1, which goes from z to x. And we claim these functions are mutually inverse, which means each one's the inverse of the other. And uh, if that's true, it then follows, so we haven't proved that claim yet. If true, this shows both are bijections. Okay. We have to check the composites both way round. G composed with F, composed with F to the minus 1, composed with G to the minus 1, could be rebracketed however you like because composition is associative. So that's G composed with F composed with F to the minus 1, composed with G to the minus 1. That's because Composition is associative. Uh, F composed with F to the minus 1 is the identity on Y. Uh, we'll need more. So that's equal to g composed with the identity on y composed with g to the minus 1, um, because f composed with f to the minus 1 is equal to id y. Id y doesn't do anything, so that's the same as g composed with g to the minus 1. Compose anything with an identity map and it stays the same. Uh, and that's equal to id x. Um, no, that's the way to it. G, it's, it, yes, it's it x, that's good. There we go. G to minus 1 is going from x to z. Now, let me just check where we're going from to again. G to the minus 1. 
Oh, I thought it's on Z, isn't it? G equal to G to minus 1 is Z, so I did that wrong. Let's always go to the right place. Okay, and the other way around is similar. Um, F to the minus 1 composed with G to the minus 1 composed with G composed with F can be rebracketed as F to the minus 1 composed with G to the minus 1 composed with G composed with F um, and G to the minus 1 composed with G should be id Y, just check that again G to minus 1 composed with G, G starts on Y, G to minus 1 sends you back there, so G to minus 1 composed with G is the identity on Y. So that's F to minus 1 composed with the identity on Y composed with F, and the identity on Y composed with F is just F, so that's F to minus 1 composed with F, and that's the identity on X. So they work both ways round. You get the identity on the correct set. Um, I should have known it had to be the identity on Z and the identity on X. The identity on Y couldn't have been relevant in the end. I shouldn't have been trying to get that. Uh, right, so, so this proves the claim, so both are bijection. Um, there's lots of other ways to prove it. I just wanted to show you composition of uh, functions, re-bracketing of composition of functions again, because um, that's quite handy. Right. So now let's move to a more typical situation that we'll be working in, which will be very often I'll take the set, just one, two, three, four, five, maybe I'll have, maybe I'll have six and seven and eight in, you know, I, but it really doesn't matter what the names of the elements are, but typically um, when we talk about finite permutations, we very often work with the first few natural numbers um, in our set to show how things work. But of course, finite sets with the same number of elements are pretty much the same as each other, so you can move things around and relabel if you like. Okay, now, if you've got a permutation of this set, then you need to know, let's call it sigma because we often use Greek letters for permutations, so I'll, we'll have various Greek letters coming in in a minute. Uh, so sigma of 1, sigma of 2, you need to know what sigma of 1 up to sigma of 5 are. Um, they must include the numbers 1 up to 5 once each in some order. Um, there's 120 different orders you can write them down in, and if you write them down in order underneath the numbers 1 to 5, this is a fairly efficient way of, of saying what your permutation does. So this is what's called the two-line notation for your permutation, and it says that... Um, so. If you think of this as your source and your target, I mean, really, this is uh, to do with domain and co-domain. If you start at 1, you get sent to 3. Start at 2, you get sent to 1. 3 gets sent to 4, and so on. And, uh, oh, this is interesting. Yes, that's right. Sigma of 1 is 3. Sigma of 2 is 1, and so on. Um, which you could also write as 1 maps to 3, 2 maps to 1, and so on. So the bottom line tells you where each thing is sent. And that's a fairly efficient way of writing down what your permutation does. Sometimes there are more efficient ways, but this is a fairly systematic one. It's called the two-line form. And using this, you can see exactly what your, your... I mean, you can do this for functions from the set to itself, which weren't permutations, and then um, you'd, have, you'd have the same number appearing more than once in the bottom. Um, <coughs> If you try and work out a permutation and you end up with a repeat on the bottom, then something's gone wrong because um, you fail to be injective. And if you find the number missing on the bottom, which will happen at the same time, you fail to be surjective. It's supposed to be a bijection, so every number should appear 
exactly once on the top and exactly once on the bottom. I recommend you write them in order on the top to avoid confusion. You are allowed to write them in a different order on the top if you want to, but uh, it makes life difficult for everybody, you and us. Uh, right, so I'm pointing out here that you can change the order of the columns without changing the permutation. This is the same permutation written in non-standard order and makes it harder for us to mark it and uh, harder for you to use it, but this still says that 4 is sent to 5, which is what it was before, and 1 is sent to 3, which is what it was before. But I don't recommend using that too often. It is, however, a quick way to get to a correct answer for an inverse map. So, for example, here, another Greek letter, the Greek letter pi, but this time it's not 3.14159, it's uh, a permutation. Uh, of a six set. So this is a, a six set, a typical six set. Well, okay, it's a very special six set. Um, but normally if I ask you to work with a six set, I'll use one, two, three, up to six. And uh, it sends one to six, two to four, three to five, four to one, five to three, and six to two. The inverse function, and these are bijections, so the inverse function you've got not much choice about, uh, the inverse function must send everything back where it came from. Um, it must also send things to somewhere that will be sent to the right place by the original, but you get that for free with permutations. So as long as you send everything back where it came from, that's the only thing you can do, and the easiest way to send the things back where they came from is to swap the rows over. However, it's then not in the very standard form. So the pi sends 1 to 6. So pi to the minus 1 must send 6 back to 1. Pi sends 2 to 4. So pi to the minus 1 must send 4 back to 2. OK. Um, well, I'll just write that out again. But let's put it in standard form because that's better. So that's correct, at least I think it's correct. And uh, but then, if you want to get it in standard form, which is, if you don't put it in standard form, you might then get confused later when you're doing other operations with it, because you might forget that the columns are in a funny order. So, if you want to get them into the right order, you can see that one goes to four. And 2 goes to 6, 3 goes to 5, 4 goes to 2, 5 goes to 3, and 6 goes to 1. So that's more standard. But they're both correct. Uh, right, so that's um, some pretty easy stuff so far. Oh, and the identity map is always a permutation. Identity map is a nice bijection from a set to itself, whatever the set is. And if the set is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the identity map has a particularly boring form of uh, the two-line form where you just write the same number down. Which is telling you that the things in the top row are being sent to things in the bottom row, but nothing is moving. So uh, uh, that's, that's your identity map. Any questions so far about permutations? <coughs> Okay, as I say, this, this may be, uh, this is probably new, but I find that, that mostly, I mean, there's often a very routine exam question on this, and on that routine exam question, um, most people get full marks or almost full marks every time. Uh, so this seems to be something that everybody can learn to do, which is, to multiply permutations by composing them. Now we know that if you compose two bijections, you get a bijection. Now permutation is a bijection from a finite set to itself. So if you compose two permutations, you get another permutation. 
So that's what's going on there. It says by our earlier results, which is that if you compose two bijections, you get a bijection. Um, so various Greek letters you could use. Um, so here's a Greek letter rho, Greek letter sigma, Greek letter tor or tau. Um, or pi, as we used a moment ago, um, can be used for permutations. And when you multiply permutations by composing them, you often miss out the composite sign. So, so rather than writing sigma composed with tau, which means do tau first and then sigma, we'll just write sigma tau. But it still means you're doing tau first and then sigma, so that if you want to know where x goes, it ends up, you, do, you first work out tau of x and then do sigma of tau of x. And here's an example. And uh, I think what I'll do is I'll let, I'm going to give you a bit of time to work this out. And since it's fairly easy to work it out, if you get those worked out, also because we seem to be quite ahead, work out sigma to the minus 1 and sigma to, minus one, uh, sigma to the minus 1 times tau times sigma. That was a bit big, I'll just make that a bit smaller. Uh, just to get you started, right, you have to figure out where everything goes, and you're supposed to put it in two-line form. So, for example, if you're working out sigma tau, and you want to figure out where one goes, that's, you're supposed to end up at, one is going to end up at sigma of tau of one, right? So just to get you started, sigma tau of one, will be sigma of tau of 1. Um, tau of 1 is 2, because you see 1 goes to 2, so that's sigma of 2. So 1 gets sent to 2, and then you have to do sigma of 2, so you see 2 gets sent to 3. So sigma tau, in two-line form, it's going to start with 1, 3, and then you have to figure out what the other ones do. There are various different approaches to it, but I think the easiest thing is to say, where does tau send 2, and then when does, where does sigma send that? And that will tell you what goes underneath 2. So carry on, uh, see if you can work those out, and then we'll see if, I, uh, see if your answers agree with mine. And uh, I'll then work through them all myself, and... We'll see what we get. I'll give, you, I'll give you a few minutes to think about that since we're a bit ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, I... So someone has pointed out to me that I said earlier, I said something like, everything is sent to different places or something like that. And that turned out to be ambiguous because that meant that people thought maybe things weren't allowed to go to the place they started with. Um, so we did have an extreme example here where everything got sent to where it started. So um, you, are allowed to, you are allowed to go to where you started. What I meant is that they all have to be sent to different places from each other. Okay. So, uh, so you're not allowed to send one and three to the same place as each other. Um, that's what I meant by that. Okay, so uh, coming back to here, um, after just a little bit of practice, you will probably get faster and more reliable at this than me. Um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as it comes to arithmetic or division or anything like that, um, I'm out of practice. Um, uh, this is a, a, routine, a routine calculation, and uh, therefore I'm probably going to get wrong. But uh, let's see whether I get the same answer as you. Um, after a bit of practice, you can start to do these in your head. 
and you don't have to write down all these intermediate stages like this. So I've did, done this one with intermediate stages. I'm not going to write down the intermediate stages for the next ones, but I will talk through it. So where does two go? Well, you have to apply tor first. So two gets set to six. Then you apply sigma afterwards. So you say, where does sigma send six? It sends it to two, which means it has gone back to where it started, but that's okay. Then we look at where three goes. Tor sends three to five, and then you apply sigma afterwards. Five moves five on to six. So three must end up at six. There's a very nice error check here. You know you've gone wrong if you end up with the same number twice in the bottom row or a number missing in the bottom row. Both, either one of those will cause the other one anyway. Uh, so then you know you have to recalculate. Uh, okay, where does four go? Tor sends four to one, and then sigma sends one on to five. So that's a five. Tor sends five on to four, and then four gets sent on by sigma to one. So we're looking okay so far. I haven't done any duplicates. Six gets sent to three, and three gets sent to four. Uh, so the main thing that can go wrong with this is that you accidentally calculate tor sigma instead of sigma tor. And so if you're trying to remember which way round it is, you have to remember that it's function composition and that you're doing this. So this is a good way to remember it, is to remember what it means. So sigma tor of 1 means work out sigma of tor of 1, which means you apply tor to 1 and then apply sigma to what you've got. And that will help you to get the right way round. That's the most common error when this routine exam question turns up. The most common error that turns up is that people multiply the permutations backwards and lose a few silly marks that way. Um, otherwise, as I say, people usually get it right. Uh, so let's have some more sheets of paper. Um, uh, tor sigma then. This time you're doing sigma first, so 1 goes to 5, and then Tor sends 5 to 4. Actually, maybe I should ask, any questions about that first one? Okay, then uh, we'll carry on. Um, we're doing sigma first and then tor, because that's what tor sigma, tor sigma means. You do sigma first and then tor. It's a problem, um, but there you go. Uh, one is sent to four, two is sent by sigma to three, and that gets sent on by tor to five. Three, you apply sigma, but that gets sent to four. Four gets then sent on by tor to one. And so on. It's not very exciting, but it is quite easy. Four gets sent by sigma to one. Tor sends one to two. Five goes to six, which goes to three. And six goes to two, which goes to six. Okay. Um, sigma to minus one, we could do it in our head as well, or the way we did it before. I'll do it the same way I did it before. So I'll just swap the rows over. Oh, sorry. I said swap the rows over.
and then I'll put it in the standard order to avoid making any mistakes. So 1 goes to 4, 2 goes to 6, um, 3 goes to 2, 4 goes to 3, 5 goes to 1, and 6 goes to 5. And to calculate sigma minus 1 tor sigma, you can bracket it however you like. And we've already worked out tor sigma. So I can put brackets around it there. And uh, I can now just multiply this one by tor sigma, which is quite easy, which means do tor sigma first and then sigma and minus 1 afterwards. So I do tor sigma first, which sends 1 to 4, and then I do sigma to minus 1, which sends 4 to 3. Then I do tor sigma first on 2, which tends to you to 5, and then I do a sigma to minus 1 afterwards, which takes you to 1. Uh, 3 goes to 1, goes to 4. 4 goes to 2, which goes to 6. 5 goes to 3, which goes to 2, and 6 goes to 6, which goes to 5. Any questions about that one, that calculation? Right, now there's one clever thing which you don't need to know really, but which can sometimes give you a shortcut. So there's a clever, clever fact. Sigma to minus 1 tor sigma can also be written as sigma to minus 1 of 1 goes to tau of sigma to minus 1 of 1. Sigma to minus 1 of 2 gets sent to... Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. Sigma to minus 1 of 1 goes to sigma to minus 1 of tau of 1. Sigma to minus 1 of 2 goes to sigma to minus 1 of tau of 2 and so on. Sigma to minus 1 of 6 gets sent to sigma to minus 1 of tau of 6. Now you may not recognize this, but if you ever learn to do something like the Rubik Cube, you use this trick all the time um, as a way to put interesting moves together because once you've got one interesting move, you can do what's called conjugate it with something else and you get a, a related interesting move which does something similar, you know, if, if you knew you had a nice move tau that moves some things around, this one, um, you move the corresponding sigma to minus one of things around. Um, so you can check this one. If you just substitute those in, you should find it works. You should also have a think about why it works. Um, and this is uh, a nice trick. Anyway, I'll stop there for today.